whenever you see a function, the letters we're usually going to use for a function is f, and then the parentheses of x means the function's name is f, and the input is going to be x. And we like to think of functions as creatures that eat things in the domain, and they spit out things in the range. So the usual letters are inputs are x, outputs are y, and you can always write it y equals f of x. So the triple equal sign will maybe something new, and I use a triple equal sign to compare equations. So I can't tell you two equations are the same using a regular equal sign. And I'll show you why that would be very bad in a minute. Um, this tells me that y is a function of x. And now you might say, well, you wrote words over there. That's not a math equation. That's exactly the same math equation that I wrote on the other side. Y is, as an equal sign, a function of x. So I just rewrote exactly Y is a function of x in English instead of math notation right there. So you see the word is means equals. So why did I have to use triple equal signs? Why couldn't I just say that that equation is equal to another equation. So what happens then? What's the problem? If I say 2x equals 4, would you say that's the same thing as saying x equals 2? So they tell me the same information. So what happens if I put equals in between? What does that tell you about 4 and x? So now I just said 4 equals x can't equal 4, has to equal, I said equal 2 a second ago. So I can't use double equal signs, so what I do instead is I make up a new symbol, triple equals. So I can say that equation is the same as that equation over there. And now nobody thinks x is 4. So that's the problem where if you compare equations, you basically have to create a new symbol to say these equations are the same thing. So you're going to see me use triple equal sign to compare equations. So that's to say equation 1 is the same as equation 2. So it compares equations. So I'll try not to scroll too fast as I go. So we have x is the input and y is the output. You could think of functions as taking x's from the domain. So here's a whole bunch of numbers in the domain, a whole bunch of other numbers in the range. And then f, the function f says, oh, if you pick anything in the domain, I'll tell you exactly where it's going to go in the range. So you think of a number like 2. If it's in the domain, f will tell you what number is going to land in the range. So domain range, input, output. Domain and range are always subsets of real numbers in this class. So that big capital R might be a new symbol. So who's seen big R before? I know more of you have seen it. What does big R mean? It means all the real numbers. And interval notation, we would write it open interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's how we say all real numbers right there. So if you come from pre-calculus 1 class, at some point, what numbers are not real numbers? So imaginary numbers or complex numbers. So all real numbers, what that means is there's going to be no imaginary numbers. So we're not going to use imaginary numbers in calculus class. So if you didn't like those, 
That's okay. We'll use polar coordinates at some point in uh, Calc 3 for sure. So a lot of the pre-calculus will come back. We're going to definitely use some trig in this class. It won't be the um, most technical trig. Uh, trig really strikes back in Calc 2. So if you're going to Calc 2, you're going to see a very heavy dose of trig. And also if you're going to Calculus 2, you want to consider Calculus 1 as your boot camp for going to war in Calc 2. So Calc 2 is where it's really tough, and if you don't take uh, Calc 1, learn as much as you can, Calc 2 is going to be incredibly difficult. So you're going to find that Calculus 1, you can get by with the B or a C, but if you're going to Calc 2, a B or C is going to turn into a C or a D the next quarter. So I just want to warn you, Calc 1, if this is your final uh, math class, a B or a C is reasonable, but if you need to go to Calc 2, you really want to get as high of a possible grade as you can get, because Calc 2 is very tough. Calc 3 is not that much easier. So there's my warning about going to Calc 2. I'll warn you again on the midterm. Each midterm is you get those back as well. So if you're going to Calc 2, you definitely want to do as good as you possibly can in this class. All right, so I said there's subsets of real numbers, the domain and range. They're generally going to be uh, either open intervals or unions of open intervals, sometimes a closed interval as well. So we've seen we're going to do some domain problems. And they're generally just going to be uh, some unions of some intervals. Ah, so we do need to talk about intervals really quickly. So chapter one is review. You're just going to get a whole lot of topics really quickly. So hopefully these will be familiar with you, to you at least a little bit. So intervals, there's going to be three types. This is going to be open. So it's an open interval. Actually, let me write that open somewhere else. So if we go set builder notation, this is real numbers x such that a is less than x and x is less than b. So there's set builder notation. All real numbers x that are greater than a and less than b. And this is what we call open. We can have a closed. It looks really similar. Only difference is you have square brackets instead of either round brackets or parentheses. So it starts out exactly the same. So this says all real numbers x such that a less than or equal to 2x and x less than or equal to b. So the only difference is you're allowed to use the actual endpoints. So that's what makes it closed. Um, you could have a mix not open or closed. I don't want to insult your intelligence by writing out what these are in set notation, but I think you get the idea. You're either using A, using B, one or the other, or neither. So those are intervals. We have a slight problem with notation when we talk about open intervals. So this could be the interval from 2 to 3. What else, what other mathematical object could parentheses 2 comma 3 parentheses represent? A point on a graph. So unfortunately, you don't know which is which. So this is also could be a point. So there's intervals, and now we're going to have points. So they look like x comma y. They look just like open intervals. So you have to know in context which is which. So you can't just look at 2, 3 and tell me what it is. You have to know, is that, are we talking about a point? Are we talking about an interval? The only time that you can look at numbers like this is if the first number is bigger than the second. For example, 12, 3. That can't be an interval because you would have not written the, the 
first number had to be smaller. But in general, you don't know if it's a point or an interval. You're going to have to use context to tell it apart. When we plot 2, 3, you go over 2, up 3, plot the point right there. So that's pretty much all I need to say about points. Uh, we're not going to use polar coordinates until Calc 3, so don't need to worry about polar coordinates, just Cartesian or rectangular coordinates for now. So after we have points, what about graphs? So graph you can consider is going to be all the points. X comma f of x such that x is in the domain of f. So it's all points that the x value is in the domain and then whatever the output is, that's your y value. So that is a graph. Now in pre-calculus, we spent two or three weeks drawing graphs. So we're going to spend two or three minutes drawing graphs now. So let's do a graph 1 over x function. So what graphing method did I use when I wasn't sure what the graph should look like? Clueless method, how does that work? Put some numbers in, plot some points. So pick some x's, get some y values, and plot points. So that's how we're going to do this. How do you think a calculator plots graphs? Same way. Exact same way. They just do it a lot faster. They do all this in like a hundredth of a second. All right, plot points. What's the bad x value to use? Zero. Why zero bad? Can't divide by zero. So any other number is OK to use. Just don't use zero. So when I go and make my chart, I will write down zero, but what I'm going to do is put a line through it so we know. Yeah, it's there, but we're not going to use it. So let's go with 1 and 2, and negative 1, negative 2. So go ahead, plot those points out. And draw your graph. So there's the four points you should have gotten. So you got negative a half, negative one, one, and a half. So I plot the four points down. Now what happens when x is zero? We have what's called vertical asymptote. So this doesn't come from the clueless method. This comes from pre-calculus one. One of the things we learned is when you have one over x, that means vertical asymptote at x equals zero. 
So we're going to draw that out. Vertical asymptote x equals 0. It's going to be a vertical dotted line. x equals 0. So that's our vertical asymptote. And now we're going to do our best to connect the two points together. So we'll start with the positive 2. And I have to approach the vertical asymptote in the upwards direction here. Connect that. And then what happens if x keeps getting bigger? So if I went to 3, I'd have a third. 4, I'd have a fourth. If I went out to 10, I'd have one tenth. So when x gets bigger, the y value gets closer and closer to y equals 0 right there. So my y value starts to get very small. Something very similar happens on the negative side. I have the vertical asymptote I approach on the bottom side, here on the left. And as I keep going to the left, I go negative 1 half. So up here, when it was negative 2, I'd have negative 1 half, negative 3, negative 1 third. That number is negative, but it's going to get smaller and smaller, closer and closer to 0. So on the left side, over here, I also get y equals 0. So there's my end behavior. So we did a little bit of the clueless method, but use a lot of the skills from pre-calculus 1 to graph this for a glass and tote. Now pre-calculus 1 and behavior, that's what we're going to look at right here. So we're going to start to use calculus notation as x approaches infinity. So that's what this arrow means. So in English, this means as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So this arrow infinity means think about a million, a billion, a trillion. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. So what do we want to say? As x approaches infinity, what is happening to y? So we look at this graph y keeps getting closer to 0. So this graph, as x approaches infinity, comma, y approaches 0. So when x value gets bigger and bigger, the y value is getting closer to the number 0. So in pre-calculus notation, What I did was I drew a cloud, and on the right side, I put y equals 0 to say when x is really big, y is going to get close to 0. So if we were on a computer graphing program instead of just a hand sketch, and I kept zooming out, this only lets me zoom out so far, what it would look like is just a horizontal line if I kept zooming out because everything I drew gets smaller and smaller, and the only thing left over is these lines that go out horizontally forever. So this is end behavior on the right. So that's right end behavior. Now we're going to look at left end behavior. So it might be tempting to go x with a left arrow, but because we write to the right, we don't go and use left arrows too frequently. So as x approaches, what should I put here? We're going to go negative infinity. So I'm going to go the other way. It's a little bit weird because we use the arrow to the right. Well, I should to the right, but we're going to go negative infinity, which really means to the left. So generally, we'll draw our arrows going to the right, even when we actually mean uh, to the left. So this is left end behavior as x approaches negative infinity, comma, what happens to y? What number is y approaching when x goes to the left? So y is approaching 0 also. So if we were in pre-calculus class, I would have drawn a cloud. On the left side of the cloud, 
I would have drawn a horizontal line, uh, I should point this way, y equals zero. So that would be on the left side of the cloud. And x equals zero, this is our vertical asymptote. So there is rational function graphing in a nutshell, very quickly. We're going to look very closely at n behavior after we have, uh, after we do limits and continuity. So we'll come back to n behavior. All right, step functions. So step functions, it's good to just start out with an example here. So we'll have three pieces to this step function. So we're gonna go negative x minus one when x is less than negative one. x squared. If x is between negative one and positive one. And just the number one if x is greater than or equal to one. So when you graph a step function, individually there's three functions to graph. So the three functions are y equals negative x minus one, second function y equals x squared, and the third function is y equals one. So I'll do the easy one, y equals one. So I'll graph y equals one. What do I have to do to my y equals one function so it'll actually uh, fit in with, with the other pieces in my step function? So this is the right third piece. What did I not pay attention to in the step function? So I look and see x, the biggest, our smallest x could be is one, it could be anything more. So what I have to do is say, all right, there's one, so I need my eraser, which I think is set up to erase my entire line, yes. So I want to start at one and go to the right. So it is a horizontal line, y equals one, but it needs to start at x value one and then get all the x values bigger than one. Now it's okay for x to equal one here, so I need to fill this in. So there's the x value of negative one, so I need an x squared function here from negative one to one, and then negative x minus one is a line with the slope negative one, y-intercept negative one. So go ahead and finish off the two pieces of the graph. I'll give you a minute to do that.
So that's what your graph should look like. You have your parabola right in the middle, from negative one to positive one. And then the slope negative, the line is slope negative one, y intercept negative one. So I would have intercepted the y-axis down here at negative one, but I didn't want to draw that whole part of the line, so I just started right at negative one. And then just went up to the left. So here's our three pieces on the step function. They matched up perfectly right here. So this So they matched here. They obviously did not match over there. And we're going to find out that there's a big difference between the two. So this is what we call a jump right there. So they're going to, we're going to find out the jump is called not continuous. And when they match, it'll be called continuous. So we'll have some nice math words for these ideas right here, instead of saying matching and jumping. Now, increasing, decreasing, even odds. These are all function properties we're going to look at next. So this f is always going to be our function here. So f is increasing on the interval a, b. If any, so we're going to use some fancy notation that says if any x1, x2 in the interval a, b. And instead of putting a comma, I put a less than sign. So I'm going to take two x values in the interval a, b. But I want x1 to be the smaller of the two. So I'm just picking out any two numbers out of the interval. And then x1 is going to be the smaller one. So if any x1 is less than x2 in the interval, then f of x1 is less than f of x2. So we have two x values. That means the y values look like this. The y value for x1 is lower than the y value for x2. So this is a whole lot of math writing to basically say, if you go to the right, you go up. So that's a better way to think about increasing. Go to the right, you go up. So you're going to find that generally things are always to the right. So you want to always think to the right. We read to the right. Our number line increases to the right. So to the right, increasing means to the right and up. Now I'm going to point to the right a lot, which is going to be your actual left, I think. So you go to the right and you go up. So just think increasing or going up a hill. All right, decreasing. That's up next. You always want to think to the right. So decreasing, you go to the right and you want to go down. So that's the opposite of going right and going up, is going right and going down. So that's decreasing. So if it's decreasing on AB, if any x1 less than x2 in the interval a, a, b, then f of x1 is greater than f of x2. So we have, you go to the right, and now you go down.
Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, sh it should be. Yeah, you want x1 on the left, x2 on the right. You want to switch one of the two inequalities, or else you're going to say, because you want to say increasing is to the right and up. You still want to the right, but we want the opposite y order. Otherwise, we'd be talking about to the left and down, which would be the same as to the right and up. So you always want to think to the right. So your x coordinates, you want them ordered in a regular way, and then you can just pay attention to your y coordinates. You could swap the inequality sign you were looking at, but then you'd have to swap, you'd have to put the other one the same. All right, so that's increasing, decreasing. Here's a really easy way increasing. There you go, arrow up to the right, that's it. That's increasing. Decreasing to the right, we're gonna go down, like that. The next thing you're going to find out is the arrowheads are going to mess you up. So don't even draw that. Just draw a line that goes like this. If you put an arrow on it, at some point your arrow is going to point down to the left. And that actually means increasing. So if you think about this arrow right here, oh, it's to the right. Look, increasing. What happens when you look to the right? Is it going up or down? Down. So don't look at this. Just look at the line. You go to the right, you go to the right, and you go down. So you're going to find that the way arrow's pointing is going to mess you up. So look at the actual slope of the line. Don't look at the way the arrow's pointing. All right, even and odd. So these are functions, not numbers. You should know even and odd numbers by now. This is an even function. F is even if f of negative x equals f of regular x. So if f didn't care if the input was negative, then same thing as if it was positive, that's even. Odd is similar. f is odd if f of negative x equals negative f of x. So I think of even as not caring if x is negative. And I think odd is the property you can pull the negative through the function. So I'll think of moving the negative sign or the negative 1 through the function. And then even, I like to think of f as doesn't care if x is negative. So where did even and odd come from? Here's a super fast example. Here's the easiest even function I could think of that's not, tr that's not constant. So why is the function even? What happens if you put negative in there and you square it? Positive. So if I put negative 5 in, same thing as if I put regular 5 in. So any negative number you think of, same as putting the positive number in. So why do we call it even? It comes from polynomial powers. If all your powers are even, it doesn't matter if your input was positive or negative. It's going to get squared out to be positive anyways. All right, easy odd example. There's a few. I'll go x cubed. So three negatives. So negative times negative times negative. You get to keep your negative sign. So if you've got an odd number of negatives, multiply them together, you get to keep your negative sign. So odd functions, if it's just polynomial, will have all odd powers. And how about symmetry? What symmetry was even? Anybody remember? X to be positive or negative? So that'll be our 
y-axis. Whatever happens on one side of the y-axis, you can flip it over. Origin's more tricky. Remember, functions don't have x-axis symmetry or they're not a function. The only one left is origin symmetry. You can rotate it halfway around the origin. So there's y-axis and origin symmetry right there. Generally, you're not going to have x-axis symmetry. So this is a good place to stop. We'll do types of functions tomorrow.